Today on Lawyers with Game, we're joined by my law school classmate, Hakeem Anifawakan, VP at the Oklahoma City Thunder. Join us for a discussion on NFTs, NIL, and the NBA. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Lawyers with Game. If you're interested in learning more about legal issues in the worlds of esports and video games, you are in the right place. My name is Darius Gambino, and I am first and foremost a lifelong gamer. I've played on just about every home system from the original Atari to the Sega Dreamcast to now the PlayStation 5. I'm also an intellectual property attorney with over 25 years of experience advising clients on issues related to patents, trademarks, and copyrights. I work for the law firm of Saul Ewing in Philadelphia, and you can find me on Twitter as at Philly IP. If you want to find me for a game, my gamer tag is EaglesFan71 on the PlayStation Network. Today with me is my co-host, Leah Leyendecker. Leah and I are both members of the video gaming and esports group at Saul Ewing. Leah, maybe you can say a few words about yourself and introduce our special guest for today. Yeah, thanks, Darius. Um, so I'm, I'm also an attorney here at Saul Ewing in our Minneapolis office. Um, and I advise clients on a range of IP and corporate matters um, and have been working with organizations in the traditional sports, esports, and gaming um, ecosystem uh, for the last several years. Um, my first introduction to gaming was really playing Sega Genesis with my younger sister um, decades ago after school every day, and then sort of rediscovered gaming when I started working in the space, uh, and most recently have been playing a little bit with my four-year-old who has taken an interest in our Nintendo Switch. Um, so that's been a really fun uh, experience. With us today, we have Hakeem Anifawakan. He is the Vice President of Corporate Legal for the Oklahoma City Thunder and advises on a broad range of corporate matters, including IP and technology matters. Prior to joining the Thunder, Hakeem served as corporate counsel for NASCAR. Uh, but most importantly, Hakeem is a good friend of mine from law school. Uh, we go back to, to day one, our uh, 1L section. Thanks for having me, Leah. Welcome, Hakeem. If you like these videos, please like and subscribe. If you'd like to know more about our law firm, you can visit us at www.sol.com. And please keep in mind that this is intended to be a very high level and general discussion of legal issues in the esports and video game spaces. It is not intended as actual legal advice. If you need actual legal advice, please reach out to myself or Leah, and we'll be happy to help you. So today we're going to be talking with Hakeem about the collision of traditional sports and technology. We're going to talk about blockchain, NFTs, and lots of other interesting things. I'm going to kick it over to Leah to get us started. So Hakeem, um, I first wanted to ask you a little bit about your career path um, and your personal connection to sports, esports, and, and video games. Yeah, so growing up, I played both traditional sports and video games. Uh, for traditional sports, I played uh, a lot of basketball, um, and I was also on like the track and field team growing up. Um, and I don't play video games as often as I did growing up. Uh, but my first introduction to video games was uh, Super Nintendo uh, and then N64. Uh, and for both consoles, uh, my favorite game or my game of choice was Mario Kart. Uh, Yoshi was, was my driver of choice. Usually won a lot with him. Um, and then I would say like my video game career ended around Halo 2 or so uh, on the Xbox system. Uh, but I, I enjoyed grow, uh, playing sports growing up so much um, that I knew I wanted to work in the, in the sports industry. Um, I graduated from the University of Minnesota, uh, where I received my degree in sports management uh, and also received my JD from the University of Minnesota Law School. Um, and in law school, I had two internships that really helped uh, start my career off in the sports industry. Uh, one was a legal internship at NASCAR, uh, and the other was a legal and business affairs fellowship uh, with the NFL Players Association. Um, and I think both of those experiences kind of led me to a full-time role at NASCAR as corporate counsel, as you had mentioned, Leah, um, a couple of years after graduating law school. Um, and then my time at NASCAR, fortunately, led me to this opportunity with the Oklahoma City Thunder, um, and I joined the team last May, uh, May of uh, 2012, or uh, sorry, 
uh, May of uh, 2021. Hakeem, I, I love that you're an OG N64 player. <clears throat> um, I want to ask you um, a little bit about college to start out. So I went to Villanova, uh, and you've got one of our former players there, and Jer- uh, Jeremiah Robinson Earl. So I've been following his career, uh, just like all the other Villanova players. Um, and one big thing that changed this year for college players was the ability um, to start monetizing their name, image, likeness rights, something we fer- refer to shorthand as NIL, right? Um, and so this, this first class um, coming out this year are the first ones that really had that ability to do that. And, and your rookie, Chet Holmgren, uh, before he signed, had already done deals with Tops and Bose. So I wanted to ask you, how do you think um, the emergence of NIL will change things um, for the NBA? Yeah, so for professional sports, including the NBA or uh, the NFL, I don't don't see the NCAA or state law surrounding NIL um, changing things too much, um, at least in terms of like sponsorship opportunities. Um, In professional sports, it's common to see athletes with different sponsors than their teams or, or leagues may even have. Uh, for example, Nike is the official um, uniform provider for the NFL, the NBA, and Major League Baseball. Um, so you'll see a Nike swoosh on all the jerseys. But when you look closely at the athletes, you kind of see them wearing different sneakers from competing brands. Um, and kind of similar thing in professional golf or tennis, where you see athletes wearing different brands either on their hats or their polos, um, then uh, their league partner, either the WTA or the PGA Tour may have for their official partners. Um, But one impact I do see the NIL opportunities having for college athletes or student athletes in particular is them being able to stay in school longer um, and, and earn an income from their name, image, and likeness rather than going to the NBA earlier or going to the NFL earlier or um, going to MLB or any other league, professional league earlier. So like, for example, if a, if a player is a fringe NFL late round pick, but they have a major college presence, um, they might elect to stay in school for their senior year or their fifth year redshirt year um, and earn money while hopefully increasing their 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 uh, draft stock. So I think we've seen that a little bit in that first year um, of NIO, and I think we'll kind of continue see that continue to grow over the years as well. Yeah, it's going to be really interesting. Leah? Yeah. Um, so I want to switch gears a little bit, Hakeem, and, and ask you about the metaverse. Um, So I recently read an article that described what it's like watching an NBA game courtside, um, but in the metaverse, uh, specifically using Meta's Horizon Venues platform. Um, So people, you know, appear as avatars, sort of digital versions of themselves um, and watch an NBA game from the courtside. So I'm I'm really curious to hear your thoughts about, um, you know, generally about this NBA virtual reality experience and whether you think this is something that will become popular with fans? Well, I haven't been able to experience the NBA VR personally, but I think the concept is incredible. Uh, and it's an incredible way to interact and, and engage with fans, um, not only in your, in your city or your, or your local state, but just around the world, right? So there's 30 NBA teams uh, in 28 different cities. Um, so a majority of our fans won't be able to attend a game in person uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, and if you've ever sat courtside or near courtside at an NBA game, you know how fantastic of, of an experience that is and how fun that is. So if you're able to feel like you're sitting courtside and that having like a, a coach walk in front of you and block your view or a player get up and, and walk to the scorer's table, um, if you're able to experience that while sitting on your couch, like that's an incredible way uh, to an opportunity to engage with fans from across the world. So I think it definitely has a chance to become popular, not only with NBA fans, but non NBA fans that are just interested in trying to figure out what that experience actually feels like. Um, I I think the technology uh, portion of it too is still in its 
in its infancy stages. So it's going to get better as, as uh, more people utilize the technology. Um, and as the technology improves, so, so will the user experience with all those, um, uh, those opportunities. Yesterday, I saw a study done by Oracle Food and Beverage in partnership with the San Francisco Giants. Uh, and they surveyed more than 5,000 fans. Um, and 64% of those fans that they would like to engage with their favorite team in the metaverse and 50% uh, even said that they would love the idea of participating in a virtual crowd. Um, so with fans willing to engage in these type of expansive reality experiences, whether it's VR or AR, um, I can definitely see it growing over the next decade um, and leading to more opportunities for brand activations, meet and greets with fans and players and coaches, and a variety of other opportunities using this technology. We keep hearing the metaverse is the next big thing, but uh, we'll have to wait and see on that. Um, I wanted to ask you about some of the Oklahoma City Thunder's esports initiatives. Uh, your G League team, the Blue, um, for the past two years has done an esports tournament um, with Oklahoma City University, benefiting um, a, a children's organization, a charity entitled Extra Life. Um, can you talk about that uh, initiative and, and any other esports initiatives that uh, the Thunder are working on right now? Yeah, so one of our goals as a team is to have a meaningful impact and leadership in our community. And I think this initiative with the Blue is, is a great example of that. Um, so our G League team, the Oklahoma City Blue, partnered with uh, a local university, Oklahoma City University, um, and hosted their esports team and club. And then also just like a lot of members in the community for an all day tournament. Um, and the first year that we had it, we actually were able to host it um, downtown here at the old convention center, um, which is the same facility that the blue played at um, at the time. Um, so hundreds of gamers were able to come out and play at the same facility that professional basketball players are playing in, uh, which is a, what's a, a very cool experience for them. Um, and then they also got tickets to uh, watch and uh, watch the blue play as well uh, for that next day. Um, and, and with all of that, we're able to raise money for Extra Life. And those de donations went to a local children's hospital foundation, which does research for cures and better treatment and, and make sure that no child in Oklahoma is turned away from treatment for the inability to pay. Um, so for us, it's never lost on us that we can have a great impact in our community by doing uh, different events like this esports tournament um, and doing different uh, events and opportunities outside of the game of basketball. We try to never take that for granted. Um, and obviously I think, you know, our, our goal is to also develop lifelong fans and, and have a lifelong connection with the Thunder uh, when, when you have hundreds of people and uh, either watching or participating in an esports tournament like this. Um, but our, our, our real main leader is to kind of be a leader in the community, really impact our community. And I think hosting this tournament and, and being able to raise money for Extra Life was a great example of that, uh, along with other things that we like to be involved in in, in the community. Hakeem, I wanted to ask you a little bit about the Thunder's partnership with um, Socios.com, which is the, the leading global blockchain provider um, for the sports and entertainment industry. Um, can you talk a little bit about sort of what led to that partnership um, and some of the fan engagement initiatives that have come out of it? Yeah, so one of the things that we try to do um, is to really have a forward thinking and we call it like an always onward mindset. Um, and we like to celebrate innovation. And I think our partnership with Socios is, is a great example of that. They have a lot of connections um, with major international sports properties and brands like FC Barcelona, uh, Manchester City, and I think even Argentina and Portugal national uh, soccer or, or na uh, national football clubs. Um, so with, with that in mind and, and having a like-minded partner like Socios, um, I, I think it, it allows us to continue to evolve in that innovative space. Um, and find new and different opportunities to connect with our fans um, and, and fans of the Thunder and fans of the NBA as well. So uh, in, in terms of fan engagement, last year we were able to 
have several fan ticket giveaways to games uh, with the backing of Socios.com. Um, and I think this upcoming year, we're looking to continue to find different new and innovative ways to connect fans of the Thunder with Socios as a brand. Hakeem, I, I can't let you get away without talking about NFTs. I mean, that's it seems like, you know, every day you, uh, you hear more news about NFTs. So um, you have, uh, you know, uh, one of your players, Josh Giddy, did a partnership with Crypto Gaming United, which is a, um, a play to earn scholarship uh, organization, which is really interesting. You have play to earn um, crypto games and there's people out there that can't afford to get involved in them. And, and that organization um, provides kind of startup capital for that. And then you have uh, Lugens Dort and Trey Mann getting involved with Dunking Ducks, which is kind of uh, an NFT that's similar to, to Bored Apes, if people uh, out there are familiar with that. Um, so, you know, with all this stuff going on, players getting involved, teams getting involved, um, you know, what? how do you see NFTs uh, impacting your day-to-day? -day? And are there any legal issues um, that you've encountered when it comes to NFTs that, that you can speak about today? Yeah, I guess with regards to legal issues and NFTs, I think the number one thing that's on our minds constantly is the protection of trademarks and our RIP that are, that's within the uh, NFT itself. Um, so there's, there's typically like two ways that, that we like to think about it. Um, at least for trademarks and other IP that we have registered. Uh, so like the first approach or the first idea of thinking is trademark licensing. So like we can protect our brand by um, dictating the, the terms and conditions as to uh, a licensed partner or another party can use our logos and use our marks. Um, and that's extremely important in the NFT space. So when looking at an NFT project like NBA Top Shot, it's really important to kind of understand what the rights the IP owner has, uh, which is the NBA in that case, um, and what rights they're giving to the customer purchasing the NFT. Um, so for NBA Top Shot, like under their terms and conditions, uh, customers can only use the NFT for display in a personal non-commercial use. So this would prevent someone from uploading their NFT to a platform like YouTube and running ads against against that NFT. Um, another example in NFT space is our limited uh, NFT drop that we actually had for our season ticket members uh, earlier this season. Uh, so one of our gifts for our uh, fans or season ticket members last year was a gifted physical piece of our first basketball court that we actually played on. Um, and you can see for those watching on camera here, you can kind of see this is an example of the actual wood floor here that was engraved for me, uh, but also we sent this out to our season ticket members um, just kind of as a gift saying thank you for, for being with the Thunder for so many years. Um, and along with that physical piece of the court, we actually worked with Fan Apple to issue a digital replica of the the first court that we actually played on in 2008 2009 but then also um, replicas of the 2011 western conference finals court and the 2012 nba finals court as well and similar to top shot we had to make sure that we were issuing a license to our season ticket members that limited the purpose of the nft specifically for their own personal use and not for any commercial use um, and then the, the second approach we usually take or the second issue is just um, like all trademark owners or IP owners is just monitoring the marketplace to see who's using your marks and logos without your permission. Um, so sometimes that includes making phone calls to local businesses or national businesses um, and asking them politely to stop using your, your uh, trademarks and logos without, without your permission. Uh, sometimes that includes sending out um, C and D letters, cis and deceased letters, um, or even you know letters or, or um, platforms like Amazon or, or Twitter or Facebook. They have um, ways to request uh, posts, advertising posts get taken down if it includes your intellectual property. So that's that's something that we often do. 
um, to protect against our IP. But obviously, like the internet's a very, you know, monitoring the internet can be a very daunting process just because it is the internet and it's global. Um, right. So we're, we're lucky enough to be able, we're not the only NBA team that, that, that has these issues. And we're also not the, the only sports team that has that issue. So we're lucky to have partners with the NBA and the other 29 NBA teams. But also, you know, we have colleagues in the NFL, Major League Baseball, NHL, um, NASCAR that have similar, similar issues. So if they see something, they usually give us a call and reach out and vice versa. So uh, those are some of the ways that we, we like to protect our IP as much as possible. Yeah, one of the things that's real that's kind of interesting in the NFT space, I mean, in the last 10 years, you saw kind of fan art sites like Redbubble and uh, Etsy um, have a lot of, you know, trademark, trade dress problems. Um, and, and brand owners are had to draw a line between enforcement and encouraging fan engagement, right? Uh, and I think, you know, with, with open marketplaces uh, for NFTs like OpenSea and others, um, you're going to see some of that same fan art in the in version of an NFT. Uh, and I think we'll see that thing, that whole uh, cycle happen over again. Um, right. So um, but uh, anyway, that's uh, that that's all the time we have for today. I really appreciate you coming on, Hakeem. Uh, it's been a great conversation. We, I'm sure we could go on for a little bit longer, but uh, I think we have to wrap it up right now. So. If, uh, if anyone out there has any questions about any of the legal issues that we talked about today, drop them into the comments and Leah and I'll do our best to answer them for you. Uh, thanks again uh, to, to Hakeem uh, Anifawakin from the Oklahoma City Thunder for coming on with us. And uh, until next time, I'm Darius. This is Leah and we are Lawyers with Game. We'll see you next time.